Hello everyone and uh, welcome back to the series of lectures on uh, actinide chemistry. In the last lecture uh, we have left on um, the studies that is the different studies of uh, lanthanides and actinide and uh, in this uh, particular table uh, I have given you the lambda max as well as the epsilon max that is the molar absorbity of uh, different actinides in uh, one molar perchloric acid. And you can see that uh, many of the actinides is having a very high Emax but suggest that you can measure a, even a very small quantity of uh, these actinides using uh, UV spectroscopy and uh, in application part we have already discussed what are the kind of applications you can think of using uh, ablation spectra the first one is like uh, quantitative analysis you just want to have an idea of the oxygen state you can also do the, some um, quantitative analysis provided uh, the medium in which we want to do the quantitative analysis you should be having epsilon in that particular media so if you are knowing that epsilon values you can do some kind of uh, quantitative analysis also I have given you some example of the redox reaction also where I have shown you that uh, one can study the kinetics of the redox reaction using uh, UV spectroscopy and the complexation of metal ion using different ligands as we seen in the previous slides that uh, once these ions make a complex with the different kind of ligand under a given set of conditions their absorption spectra will change and based on that changes if you do a titration that I have shown in the figure here in which I have shown you that uh, if someone start with some concentration of neptunium and do the titration with some ligand there is a shift of the peak that occurs at around 976 to 991 and if one does the titration then uh, by fitting the titration data into there are certain software that comes for that and you can fit the data and the it is simply based on the lambert beard law and you can get an idea about uh, the stability constant of uh, this complex just by using the spectrophotometric titration you can also get uh, estimation of the lanthanides and actinides that are present in the environmental sample in a very small quantity in cases when the quantity is so small then uh, we generally prefer to use some kind of chromophoric reagents which again having a very high Sharon value and because of their very high Sharon value you can go to a very low concentration with that uh, we will move to the other spectroscopy that is called uh, emission spectroscopy so there are certain terms that uh, you may be familiar with but I will just uh, give a brief uh, note on these uh, different terminologies. The first one is absorption as we have already discussed that uh, what I mean by the absorption spectra and the next term is like excitation. So does the excitation spectra and the absorption spectra are same? The answer is uh, uh, not exactly because uh, let, us, let us assume that you have a species you have a species which has a spectra absorption that is say A in your absorption spectra you are exciting with certain wavelength of the light so you are getting this kind of spectra wavelength versus your intensity or your absorbance of suppose some species A but in your excitation spectra when we read that uh, how to record the excitation spectra then you will find that whatever peaks are coming for the absorption spectra may not be coming exactly same for the excitation spectra that we will see in the coming slides that uh, how the excitation spectra is recorded and uh, once you know how the excitation spectra is recorded you can very well understand that uh, why there is a difference between the absorption spectra and uh, excitation spectra you can say that uh, emission spectra is again uh, if you see the simple Javelinsky diagram here we know that absorption start from uh, ground state to any one state that is can be like uh, some singlet 1, singlet 2 and there with the vibronic relaxation it comes back to the ground state of the first excited state and from there they can either go by inter-system crossing to the triplet or they can come back and this kind of uh, coming back generally if it is a radiative process it will emit some kind of radiation which has already recorded and if they are falling in the reason uh, that is UV visible reason then we say it is a, a luminescence and depending on the time at which the decay is taking place it can be a fluorescence which is uh, 
having a very short period of uh, time after excitation whereas if the time is long basically in those cases it is going from segment to triplet and from there it is coming back in those cases generally it is the first fluorescence which is called uh, sometime delayed fluorescence also so i hope you have uh, these terms in uh, your previous classes so you can better understand them with that uh, we can uh, just see that uh, what are the sources that one can use for the emission spectroscopy so here i've given you the basic setup in a normal uh, fluorometer one would have an excitation source and then obviously out of certain bunch of radiations you select one for your excitation and then you put your sample there is radiation will excite your analyte from the ground state to the some state of singlet and then from vibrantic relaxation they will come here and then from there they will emit but you see that here if you see the geometry you will find that my detector is kept 90 degree to the sample chamber why it is because this intensity is too large so if you are keeping detector here and whereas the emission signals are very very weak so if you are keeping detector in this region you will be only recording the excitation source spectra you will not be able to get emission profiles so for that reason to avoid this uh, intensity from the source we use to put the emission detectors at 90 degree and from there you select the emission monochromator you record the emission spectra and you get some spectra so depending on the excitation sources as i showed you that uh, you have to excite first you have to excite your molecule from the ground state to the excited state so depending on the excitation source you can have different kind of uh, luminescence yes, such as uh, some of them have given like um, cathodal luminescence in which one use the electron beam as an excitation source or uh, x-ray or uh, particle if you use this kind of sources for your excitation they are called radio luminescence if you are using electric field then it is electroluminescence so depending on the nature of your source that you are using for the excitation you can have a variety of uh, luminescences starting from cathodal luminescence to thermoluminescence and uh, in this particular uh, we are mainly interested in photoluminescence where we are using uh, photon or you can say the light source as a excitation so when we have this excitation or uh, you excite with the, some photons then what kind of information that we can get so again you excite and then from the ground state of the excited still it is emitting so what kind of spectra we can record we can record something that is called excitation spectra we can record emission spectra beside that we can also record lifetime and so this techniques give you triple resolution one you can have some information from the excitation you can have some information from the emission spectra and you can have an added information from the lifetime also and this generally has very high to signal noise ratio and many a time it is a non-invasive and non-destructive technique so what we can do and how we are doing that we will try to see in the next slide so if you talk about the lanthanides and actinides so as we see that uh, in the lanthanide the energy level are quite far away as compared to the actinides or rather you can say the actinide causes a ladder like pathways so what happens because of this ladder like pathways in the actinides when you are exciting from the ground state to any upper state then most of the photons come back to the ground state just by a non radiative decay process so they are not fluorescent or many of the actinides you will not get uh, any fluorescence whereas in case of lanthanide this kind of ladder like pathways are missing and because of that we can see most of the lanthanides give uh, very good uh, luminescence and in actinide, actinide you are having luminescence mainly from uh, americium, curium and uh, uranium and uh, for others although they can give you some sort of uh, emission line but they are lying basically in the NIR region so we cannot say that they are uh, fluorescence so in fluorescence region we are mainly getting three that is americium, curium and uh, uranium because uh, these are the one who is emitting in the um, reason that is the visible reason we have already discussed about uh, the term symbols so i am not going into the details but i just want to add that uh, 
since uh, we are going to study about the luminescence and uh, here I am using uh, europium as a example so I just want to have uh, a look on the states that uh, europium do have and uh, as we have discussed that uh, with the F6 configuration of uh, europium 3 plus we are having a 7F state and in 7F state we are having certain um, J levels and those levels are 7F F0 to 7F6 and we have also seen that uh, out of these levels which is the ground state though 7F0 is the ground state and uh, 7F6 is the high state in this 7F level so let us let us understand first that uh, okay how how one record the um, excitation spectra or the emission spectra before going to study the in detail about the European spectra so here have you given you some of the emission spectra of uh, different uh, lanthanides and you can see that uh, many of the lanthanides do emit in the region that is visible region you can see this region or this region so they emit and some of them basically emit in uh, an eye region also so most of the colored compound are generally emitting in this region as you can see here also that european is generally reddish color so that is coming from its emission most of the compound of europium and terbium is again green so you can see the emission is in the green region so first thing i would like to tell you that how we record this kind of spectra so as i've shown you that you have a source then since we are doing a photoluminescence our source is a zero lamp in this case and then depending on your metal ion suppose uh, i'm using europium so depending on your metal ion you put a monochromator and you choose certain wavelength so for uh, europium we choose a uh, wavelength of around 394 nanometer uh, if you remember then um, in the absorption spectra of europium i have shown you that uh, this transition that is uh, happening the r 394 is basically starting from 7f0 and go up to 5l6 so this is the transition that is happening place at 394 so we are using this transition for the excitation and uh, once you excite then there is uh, obviously some uh, emission spectra so what we are doing to recording for the emission spectra so we want to record the emission spectra and what we are doing we are first fixing the excitation wavelength in this case i fix at 94 nanometer and then i excite and I scan the emission monochromator to get emission spectra and then I get certain lines here so this is the intensity and this is the emission sign we get so for emission spectra we are fixing the excitation wavelength similarly if I want to record the excitation spectra here I will also tell you about the difference that you can understand from the absorption spectra and the excitation spectra so suppose I want to record an excitation spectra I want to scan the excitation wavelengths first I have to fix the emission wavelength for europium let us say we have fixed it at certain value now what will happen you have fixed this path what does it mean that suppose you excite a certain wavelength you can only see peaks in the excitation spectra when you are seeing emission here suppose I have three peaks in the absorption spectra in the UV absorption spectra but even after excitation using this peak I am not having any emission at 6 well I will not see this in the my excitation spectra now I will try to excite at this suppose you are exciting in this region and you are able to get some peak then you will see that so only those peaks are visible in the excitation spectra which keep luminescence at whatever fixed wavelength you have chosen so in absorption spectra you may get more than one lines but it doesn't mean that all those lines are giving you the emission profile so by fixing the emission at a given wavelength when we scan the excitation monochromator we are getting some excitation spectra now we are having excitation spectra and we are having emission spectra let us say that we are having excitation spectra of kind so this is my emission spectra in which we are getting a peak here and 
again we are having an uh, so this is of my emission spectra and again we are having some excitation spectra in which i am getting peak at 394 nanometer so now i am having an emission spectra i am having an excitation spectra what i'll do i'll choose the peak maximum whatever is getting in the emission spectra and the peak maximum whatever i am getting in the excitation spectrum and these two positions i am using to find out my lifetime data so what i am doing in the lifetime data i am using excitation source at 394 emission line at 612 and both i am fixing before recording the lifetime spectroscopy so by fixing these we record the lifetime so this is the way we record uh, these three kind of spectra that is the excitation spectra emission spectra and the lifetime spectra and what are the kind of information that we can get from this kind of spectra we will discuss in the next slide and here also i have just shown you that uh, different uh, ground shift term symbol that uh, you have derived using the term symbol recipe that uh, i have given in the last lecture so you can easily follow that and you can derive most of this term symbol using that recipe so now since i told you that we will discuss about the europium but before going to the discussion i will just show you certain uh, important uh, things that one should be able to understand before uh, plotting or before recording any kind of uh, emission spectra the first thing is you should be having a knowledge of the different kind of levels you should know that what is the ground state what is the first state what is the second state so this information we should be having and when you are exciting then before the excitation the first question comes at what wavelength because if you have given a sample you don't know what is the wavelength at which i have to excite then what to do you can take help of your absorption spectroscopy and as i have shown you that in your absorption spectroscopy you may be having more than one peak you have to try at different peaks and you have to try um, at different excitation wavelength and then you scan the emission and at whatever wavelength you are getting good emissions you can say that, okay okay this is the excitation wavelength for this particular uh, metal line but how to write the transition suppose i write that uh, i am exciting from here suppose this is my ground state that is uh, 7 f0 and i am exciting and going to let us say here um, as i said that uh, we go to 5 l6 something some state suppose i am going so how to write so there is a way to write that we can write uh, like uh, 7f0 to let us say 5l6 or we can also write uh, 5l6 and then we can put an arrow like this and we can write 7f0 so what is the right way of writing how do we represent this transition that okay this is my absorption transition and this is my emission transition the rule is that uh, whenever you want to write either you want to write an uh, absorption transition or any emission transition you should always take care that your high energy state should be always at left hand side and your low energy state is on the right hand side but it mean that if you see this notation my high energy state my 5 dg euro is high energy state my high energy state is on the right side which is wrong your low energy state should be on the right hand side so this notation is wrong so what we have to do we have to always keep this in mind that whenever we are writing my low energy state should be on the right hand side so what is my low energy state here my low energy state here is suppose 7 f0 so this is my low energy state this should be on the right hand side and my high energy state suppose i am doing some 5d0 this should be on the left hand side and when i am doing any kind of absorption since it is my lower state i have to write like this and suppose i want to write about the emissions then these things you have to write like this only that your uh, low energy state is on the right side but since you are talking about emission yeah, you have to write like this so only the sign only the arrow will change the state's position will not change so um, even the recent literature i have seen lots of people do not follow this uh, notation but i think it is a good habit that if you start uh, following this habit that whenever you are writing you should be cautious that uh, always your low energy state should be on the right hand side one more thing that uh, many time whenever we are plotting we use wave number or sometimes wavelengths but in general convention one should plot always in uh, wave number scale 
with the highest wave number on the left hand side and the lowest wave number on the right hand side of the spectrum. So this is a very typical spectrum of the europium that I have given here. If you see that uh, it has several lines that arises from the transition from uh, 5d0 to different state that 7f0 to 7f1, 7f2. So all these transitions. So you can see from this diagram very well. You have excited from 7f0 to 5l6. So you have excited to 5l6. Now they are emitting. Their emission is taking from 5d0. So when they are emitting, you are getting a peak that is from 5d0 to 7f0. That generally we say that is a kind of 00, 0 peak. Then 7f1, 7f2. So like that, you start from 5d0 and you are getting all these peaks. That is 7f0, 7f1, 7f2. So when you are getting these peaks, what does it mean? But you can understand that these peaks are coming from the FF transitions, right? So you can have some idea about the energy levels of the metal line, of the atom you are probing. You can also see that when we are moving from the 7F0 to the 7F4 states, you can see the distance between the J's and J plus 1 lines. If I say the distance between F0 and F1 line, if you see the distance between this F0 and F1 line, they are very close to each other. But the moment you go for higher, so when I say higher means suppose you are instead of uh, like uh, 5D0 to 7F0, now you are seeing distance between 5D0 to 7F6 and 5D0 to 7F5 transition. So when you are measuring at the higher J value, you are finding that the distance between the two J lines are increasing. This is uh, coming from the Landy interval rule that the interval is increasing as we are going from the left hand side to the right hand side or you can say the splitting has increased when we are moving towards the higher J values and this transition that we are getting in the luminescence they are mainly known as induced electric dipole transition and their origin is mainly due to the interaction of the lanthanide with the electric field vector through the electric dipoles of the electromagnetic radiations and uh, when you talk about this uh, transition they are again um, laboratory forbidden so their intensity is also not very good but still you see that because of certain um, intermixing of the different state since these are laboratory forbidden and they are uh, very weak so this is called induced electric dipole transition but one more transition that you can see is called uh, magnetic dipole transitions these transitions are largely independent of the environment of the lanthanide ion and uh, sometimes they are also used in uh, internal reference for your uh, spectra these are uh, some of the selection rule that uh, is given for uh, electric dipole magnetic dipole as well as uh, induced electric dipole transition and as, as i showed you that uh, all these transitions are of not same nature some of them are uh, electric dipole and some of them are magnetic dipole and here i've just given you the list that if you see that uh, the transition that is 5d0 to 7f zero so if you see this emission line from 5d0 to 7f0 this is electric dipole but the second one that is a 5d0 to 7f1 that is a magnetic dipole when i say magnetic dipole it means its intensity do not have very much variation when we are changing the ligand field and rest other you can see these are electric dipole transition so many a time this transition that is 5d, 5d0 to 7f1 are used as an internal standard when we are uh, trying to compare different systems of uh, same ion and we will try to understand what is the ligand strength and how the ligand is doing splitting and what ligand is doing what kind of splitting so sometimes we use this kind of magnetic dipole transitions for uh, understanding of the ligands or the symmetry around the metal ion these are some of the selection rules that is generally comes from the quantum mechanical calculation that what kind of transitions are allowed and uh, what kind of transitions are forbidden using this um, set of uh, rules that are called selection rules and depending on the selection rule those transitions who follow the selection rule they are intense whereas uh, those transitions who do not follow the selection rule they are uh, either they do not happen or if there is some intermixing between the different uh, f states they have certain uh, probability of happening and because of that uh, they get some intensity but again it is a very poor intensity. So we will now discuss about the application of emission spectra. Once you have emission 
spectra recorded. What are the kind of information that you can draw from the emission spectra? The first information you can easily draw whether you have different complexes or the same complexes. When I say different complex or the same complex, my metal center is same. When I say different, I mean the symmetry around the metal ion. Suppose you are having a complex, let us say europium, with three different ligands that is L1, L2 and L3. But you can see directly from this figure that although they are having europium in the center, but the peak intensities and the splitting and the pattern is quite different from each other. So just by looking at this spectrum, what information you can directly derive is that the symmetry around europium ion in the three system are different. So this is the direct information we can get. Suppose you want to have information about the stability, then you can take any one system and as we are doing titration in the absorption spectra, you can do some sort of titration here also and from the titration data, you will get the stability constant of that particular complex. So this can also be used for the calculation of the stability constant. You can also use this kind of uh, spectroscopy for the detection of lanthanide and actinide in the environmental sample and uh, Detection of uranium in um, various kind of environmental sample using laser fluorometry, which is a kind of uh, emission technology technique, is uh, very common. So this is also used for the understanding of uh, symmetry as well as uh, for the quantification of the metal ion into the environmental samples. They can also tell you about the symmetry, exact symmetry around the metal ion. As I said that you can say the symmetry is different, but what is the symmetry? That you can tell using uh, this uh, emission spectra that will come into the next slide but before that as i told you that uh, you have certain peaks and out of those peaks the peak at 7 at 1 is magnetic dipole rest others are electric dipole so if you take the ratio if you take the ratio of the magnetic dipole transition to the electric dipole transition you will get something that is called as asymmetry ratio and this asymmetry ratio is very important when we want to understand the symmetry around the europium ion. It so happens that this ratio is very high when the symmetry is very low and the ratio is low when the symmetry is higher. For example, in water where the symmetry is very high, this ratio is around 0.5 to 0.6. So this asymmetry ratio can be used to understand at least to say that whether the symmetry is high or the symmetry is low. But what is the exact symmetry? To get that information, we have to look this table. So as we have known that when we are having some state, let us say 7F0 or 7F1 or 7F2, any state that we are having any term symbol. So we have seen that, okay, these are getting split because of LS coupling. But what about this state? They further get splitted because of the JJ coupling. And what we get, the splitting is nothing but 2J plus 1. So you can say the 7F1 can split into 2J plus 1 means like 3 another state. So that is 7F plus 1, 0 and minus 1. So you can say that all the J states can further split depending on the field around them, depending on the electric field around them. So from this splitting pattern that we get in the J, we can understand what is the exact symmetry class of that particular metal ion or what is the symmetry around that particular metal ion. One thing you have to take care that uh, you can just tell about the symmetry class. You, you may not be able to tell you about the exact point group what belongs to because for a given uh, point group the splitting pattern is identical. So you may not be able to get exactly whether it is uh, D4H, D4, D4, uh, D4B but you can certainly say that yes when we have certain splitting suppose you are having this splitting that the first peak is mono splitted and this is the 2 and this is 4 so you are having this kind of splitting better you can definitely tell yes the europium is having a tetragonal environment but exactly this d4h and d4v it is not that easy to tell but uh, people try to tell that using uh, studies at low temperature but uh, that uh, require a lot of experience and it's not that straightforward but you can at least have an idea about the class symmetry class using uh, just by looking at the splitting of the J level. So here I have given some example that uh, how they look like. So suppose you have uh, splitting in this uh, 7F2 level. Here you can say the maximum is 5 and uh, to get maximum you should be having symmetry 
in the triclinic region where you can say that uh, 7 f2 should be 5 so the more unsymmetric the environment more is the gg splitting so triclinic is the less asymmetric or the most asymmetric so we are getting 5 pe peaks here and you can say 7 f1 which has uh, maximum gg splitting of 3 mm -hmm. we are getting 3 peaks so like that if you are doing temp uh, studies at a very low temperature you can get uh, these fine splittings and from this number of fine splitting of different gg flavors you can get information about the class the symmetry class of uh, european man that uh, what is the symmetry around the european man in this particular complexes we have also studied about the hydration of european man and there we have seen that uh, the luminescence spectra can also be used to find out the number of water molecule into the primary hydration sphere and for that one used to measure uh, something called decay half time and i've shown you that uh, for measuring this decay half life and decay time you have to excite at certain wavelength and then you have to measure emission at a certain wavelength and that should be done at a given wavelength at given excitation wavelength at given emission wavelength so once you have a certain wavelength let us say for europium the excitation at around 394 and uh, emission at 612 you'll get some kind of curve like this which you follow with time once you get this kind of curve what we have to do we have to just fit this curve using a mono exponential decay lifetime so what is that decay you have curve that is intensity here intensity and time is here you are measuring time suppose in millisecond or microsecond so the curve is like you have a exponential to the power minus t that is your x axis into decay constant that is so the equation is like uh, a exponential minus t that is the time on the x-axis into your decay constant that will give you the intensity this is for the mono exponential similarly we can write for the bi exponential or the tri exponential and from there you can get information about kobs that is the decay observed decay constant and from this observed decay constant you can have idea about the number of water molecule in the primary sphere how we can get that idea because we are having certain linear relationships so suppose you take about europium we are having a relationship between number of primary hydration sphere water in the primary hydration sphere and your observed decay constant here you have to take care that all these values are given in milliseconds so suppose you have a lifetime of 100 microsecond so before using this apply, uh, before using this equation you have to convert this microsecond to the millisecond so you have to convert that before using this equation and once you do that you can put the equation in this and for 100 microsecond you will be getting around 8 to 9 water molecule so directly using this relationship and the knowledge of uh, decay constant you can get the idea about the number of water molecule in the primary hydrogen sphere in the graph here shows that the variation in the primary hydrogen sphere number of water molecule in the primary hydrogen sphere with the pH when you are titrating a given metal ion here the metal ion taken is the curium so suppose you have curium and you are titrating you have added some ligand any ligand you can choose here suppose you have added that ligand into the system and now you are varying the pH what will happen that when the ligand when you are varying the pH a pH will come when the ligand is more and more deprotonated and the moment is deprotonated what will happen suppose curium is having 8 water molecules here around them and your ligand is deprotonated and it has two sides so now it can attach to the metal ion and it can remove two water molecules and since it is removing two water molecule so whatever is there in your aqua complex you will get a decrease of two water molecule so depending on the nature of ligand that can happen at a different pH for example in the first two ligands you can see that even at pH 2 the complexation is so strong that almost all the water molecules have been removed whereas for certain other, uh, other complexes such as uh, NTFC, nitrilotriacetic acid this is not that straightforward so it is a stepwise removal of the water molecule so just by doing the lifetime spectroscopy you will get uh, this kind of information in changing number of uh, primary water molecule using uh, different ligand in a set of uh, pH conditions and um, this table is also showing you that uh, for a given uh, ligand depending on the stoichiometry of the metal ligand complex how many water molecules are possible so suppose I give you ligand that is again nitro, uh, nitrilo triacetic acid and I assume that it has a stoichiometry of 1.1 so if you have a stoichiometry of 1.1 how many water molecules should be there in the primary sphere 
and you can just uh, follow it, the equation that is given on the top that uh, from this you can always get the information about the number of primary water molecule into the metal hydration sphere. So with that uh, I would like to end. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening.